Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we're making a start on Unit 3, the final unit of Higher Biology, which is called Sustainability and Interdependence. Today we're going to be looking at Key Area 1, which is entitled Food Supply, Plant Growth and Productivity. What I'm going to do is, something I've not done with these videos before, is split this video into two parts. The reason for this is that this key area is actually quite long and it's also split into two distinct parts. The first part is really looking at food supply and plant growth, which you may be reminded of some of the elements of the Life on Earth unit of National 5. However, the second part then goes into photosynthesis, which can take a little while to get your head around. So rather than bombarding you with one really long video, uh, this time it's going to be part 1A, which is the food supply and plant growth that you're listening to right now. And I'll also put up 1B, which will be photosynthesis. So just make sure you do these in the correct order. So just to make a start in this here, we're going to be looking at human population growth. Uh, this is something that's in the news a lot, it's been discussed a lot. Um, but just to look at some past examples of population growth, there was back in 1999, an article about the 6 billionth baby, uh, when the population of the world hit 6 billion. If we then fast forward to 2011, we hit 7 billion. And as we can see, that's a very dramatic increase in the human population in a pretty short amount of time. If you have a look at human population growth calculators or graphs online, you can see that our human population is growing at an incredible rate. And this is what this part of the course is really looking at the impact of this incredibly large and incredibly quickly reproducing human population and in terms of higher biology we look mostly at how we are going to feed that now in terms of feeding one thing that's quite interesting is the mandarin uh, word for population uh, renghao is actually made up of two characters here. Now, this is not part of the course, but it's just interesting to have a look at. Ren is meaning people, and Kao is meaning mouths or to feed. So the word for population in Mandarin really means uh, the number of mouths to feed or people who are hungry. This is the main part we're looking at in higher biology, is as the human population increases, there's an increased demand for food. So we need to produce more food in order to feed that rising population. However, we only have a limited amount of land and the whole idea of sustainability comes in, which is what we're going to talk about just in a short while. Uh, this is a really interesting part of the course and I do really suggest that you have a look further into this at some point, uh, but obviously we'll be going through the higher points for the rest of this video. So in terms of food security, this is one important definition for you to have. The idea of food security is defined as the ability of a human or the human population to access food, so to be able to access food, of sufficient quality and of sufficient quantity. So what that means there is you need, for you to be food secure, you need to be able to access or get food. You need to be able to get enough of that food, but it also needs to have enough nutritional value also to sustain you. And this is where we look at comparisons across the world, where we can go to a supermarket and we can access a huge array of food with very high levels of nutrition, but there's areas in the world who do not have this. And this is where the idea of being food secure or being not food secure comes in. So again, to get this idea uh, back into your head here, these are the three main points that you have to get into your head. It's all about access to quality and quantity. I need to state all three of these in a lot of exam questions. So quantity, meaning that sufficient food has to be available at all times, you'd have enough of that food. Quality, that the food is sufficiently nutritious and it's varied, it gives you a balanced diet, it gives you all the nutrition that you need. And access, meaning you have, you're able to obtain the food, uh, both in terms of physically obtaining it, but also in terms of economics, so being able to pay for it, food being cheap enough for you to buy enough to survive. And that is the idea of food security. If you have access to the quantity and quality of food, then you are food secure. Now, in terms of actually growing this food, this is what this part of the course is really going to be looking at. Uh, again, you might remember some of this with National 5, where you looked at pesticides and fertilizers. But food production has to be sustainable. And sustainable is a word that comes up a lot. 
What it means in this context here is that you should be able to produce this food year on year without having any negative impacts. So what we want to look at here is that food production has to be sustainable, so it cannot degrade or worsen or deteriorate the natural resources on which that agriculture depends. So it means that this system, if you look at this picture here of a very high scale uh, crop harvest going on, it should not deplete the nutrients in the soil, it should not reduce the biodiversity, so the species that are living in that area, and it also shouldn't pollute the environment. And in National 5 we talked about the difference between uh, natural fertilisers and artificial fertilisers, the effect that runoff can have into water supplies and such. For us to be sustainable, we cannot negatively impact the environment. Now, what we're going to talk about for the, the next uh, six slides here is ways to actually increase food production. Uh, because basically, uh, as I said earlier on, this video or this key area goes on to photosynthesis. The idea of that is because all food really comes back to crops, to vegetation that's growing. We grow crops like vegetables, but also any livestock, as such as animals that, uh, that we also have, they eat the grass, the vegetation, the crops, that side of things as well. So for you to increase food production on Earth, you need to be able to control positively plant growth. So one way of doing this is breeding higher yielding cultivars. So this is uh, breeds or forms of a crop that are able to produce a higher yield or a higher amount that you can harvest. You can protect the crops from pests, protect the crops from disease, like we spoke about before. You can also decrease the competition. If there's too many plants competing uh, in one area, there's not going to be enough nutrients for them all to access. You also want there to be that appropriate level of soil nutrients and the appropriate soil profile, which is what we're going to look at in a second. We're just going to go into these six uh, different factors just in a little bit more detail to make sure you fully understand it. So in terms of breeding higher yield cultivars, uh, that will give you a bigger yield. Remember, yield is what you can harvest from a crop, the amount that you can take away and sell and eat. So if you breed these higher yield versions of the plants, you'll increase the yield, which is good. You're trying to feed more people. But that might require more intensive farming methods, and it's more dependent on certain soil profiles and nutrients. It's almost that they're more picky. Uh, we'll get to that later on. In terms of pests, you'll remember controlling pesticides from uh, National 5. If there's pests on your crops, then that's going to decrease the yield because it's going to either destroy your crops by feeding on them or it's going to make the plant less healthy or cause a disease which will cause them to die and then you lose your crop in general. Uh, again, in terms of disease, if the plant's less healthy, then it may die off or it may actually produce food that's just unsuitable for eating. It can produce rotten crops, for example, that you then cannot use uh, to feed people. So again, disease decreases yield. You need to be able to control that, stop that from happening. Uh, and also with competition, if you think of people growing even uh, plants in their garden, trying to get rid of weeds, one of the big reasons for getting rid of weeds isn't just that sometimes they don't look nice, it's because they can overcrowd a plant, they can steal the nutrients, they can grow big and shade out the plants. Any form of weed or other plant that can grow too dense uh, and leads to competition with your crops will slow the growth and there'll be that competition for nutrients and space for the roots to grow as well, which would decrease your yield. In terms of soil profile, which I mentioned earlier, the profile of the soil is things like the drainage of the soil. So there's some areas where the soil is just of a lower quality or it can be too hard or too clay-like, that it means that you can't really grow anything. The roots might not be able to get through it, uh, it might get uh, flooded very easily or it might drain too quickly and it's too dry and it's very, very difficult to grow crops. So you need to make sure you have an appropriate soil uh, profile. And in terms of those nutrients, we need to make sure that plants need nutrients. Uh, you need to make sure that the nutrients are in the soil that they can use. You can add nutrients by adding fertilizers. And the other thing you can do is use crop rotations. And what a crop rotation is, is just rotating the crops that you grow in that area uh, year on year. The idea being that crops use, or certain crops use, certain nutrients. 
So if you use the same crop year on year, they use all the nutrients in the soil, use the same ones and they take them all the way, they'll get to a point where there's not enough nutrients there. However, if you grow one crop which uses its nutrients and then replace it the next year with another crop who uses different nutrients, then you can rotate that and allow the soil to replenish itself without negatively affecting the plant. What we're then going to talk about is this idea of selective breeding. So we talked about higher yield cultivars, but what can happen is we can choose to breed uh, certain plants and animals if they have desirable qualities, so things that we want from them. And it can be good for you right now to think about what would you want from a crop or from your livestock? What would you choose to breed so you can have that uh, selective breed? So for example, here, if you look at the top in terms of chicken farming, this is the chicken that you would find on a normal um, high-end uh, or large-scale chicken farm in 1957 in America. Uh, you see the size difference in 1978, and eventually in the 2000s, we're now looking at a chicken that's roughly five times the weight of what we had not long over 50 years ago. So this has been bred because we want meat from it. So we now have bigger chickens that have more muscle. Same with the pretty terrifying bull that's uh, at the bottom as well. You're wanting the biggest, strongest bull uh, passing on those genes. So through selective breeding, we've created these sort of, um, of organisms. Now, this can lead to huge changes like we see with the chicken, for example, over generations. So it does take time. This is not a quick fix, but over time we can have these major changes. But the results are also not guaranteed. And this can cause a lot of issues along with inbreeding, which is something that we're talk going to talk about in a different key area. So in terms of desirable characteristics in crops, so in plants, we, if you want to breed these desirable traits that you find in crops, you want to find high nutritional values. You want a quick growth to take place because you want to grow that food as fast as possible. You want high crop yield so it produces enough food. Resistance to pests, resistance to drought, so getting too dry, and resistance to flood is also very uh, helpful for you. You don't want your crops being killed off by things like pests or uh, if they're very sensitive to drought or low water conditions or if the, the crop gets flooded out, you don't want them dying off very easily. You want resistance to that, but you also want that high quality of produce, especially people aren't going to buy your food if it's off insufficient quality. And going back to that, Food security, you want the quantity, but you also want the quality as well of that food. Similarly for livestock, you can see that it's very similar. You want the high nutritional values, you want to get that nutrition from the, the meat that you're selling. You ideally want quick growth, and this is something that causes quite a bit of controversy in the meat industry, uh, particularly in the US, with um, sort of fattening chickens as quickly as possible, so you have that meat. You want them to have a resistance to disease, you want lean meat, so you don't really want a lot of fat on your cow. You want to have enough muscle that you can sell off as meat. You want that high production value, and again, you want that high quality if people are going to buy this. And these are what's really important in terms of selective breeding for both crops and livestock. That's what you want your crop or livestock to have and you would select for. Uh, finally, we're just going to go through a couple of parts here on agriculture. Now, as I spoke about, uh, the majority of uh, human food comes from a small number of plant crops. So things like cereals, potatoes, legumes, roots, all incredibly important. But the main thing is that all food production, even if it is livestock or meat, is dependent on photosynthesis. So as I said earlier, your crops depend on photosynthesis. If, it, if your crop does not photosynthesize, it's not producing energy itself, it's going to die. But also all livestock, all animals, including us, will be either eating the producers, the crops, at some stage, well or directly, or we eat an animal that's ate another animal that ate a crop. We all need that, uh, the agriculture in the first place. We're, I mentioned producers there, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about these now. We're going to talk a little bit about trophic levels. Now again, going back to National 5, you might remember when we looked at energy pyramids, food pyramids, and all these sort of things. We're going to come on to that again, and hopefully you, you remember a little bit about it. 
So an autotroph is a word that we're going to use instead of producer. And an autotroph is an organism that can produce its own energy from sunlight. So we spoke about producers that can produce their own energy. They take energy from the sun and they convert it into chemical energy and into their own sugars, which is what we're going to look at in the next video. If you're not an autotroph though, then you are a heterotroph. If you might remember, we used to use the word consumer. So a heterotroph is an organism that must consume other organisms for energy. So for example, this lion has had to consume another organism. It is not able to lie out in the sun and photosynthesize and make its own energy. It's not how it works. They have to consume other organisms. Now, the, the point of why we're going to look at this just now is in terms of agriculture and livestock. So we talk about trophic levels here, which you might remember from the pyramids in National 5. The trophic level of an organism is the position it occupies in a food chain. So producers or, or uh, autotrophs are always on the bottom. The first consumer who eats that is called a primary consumer, then a secondary consumer, and so on. But if you remember, the reason it's pyramid shaped on the whole with energy is that only around 10% of the energy within that trophic level, within an organism, is then passed on to the next trophic level. So as you go up each trophic level, only 10% of the energy is passed on. Or more specifically, 90% of the energy originally is being lost every single time. And that's a huge amount. What that means then is that livestock, animals, produce far less food per unit of area than plants due to the loss of energy between these trophic levels. So if you were to produce crops, so producers, autotrophs, you're getting a large amount of energy for that area. But as you work your way up, because livestock are consumers, they have lost a lot of that energy on the way up that trophic level. So they are actually producing much, much less energy or food per unit area. Now, the idea there then is it might be a fantastic idea to just have crops absolutely everywhere and not have any livestock. And this is an argument that goes back and forth, and it's something that you can maybe decide yourself. However, one of the important things to remember here is that livestock produce much more, um, sorry, much less food per unit area, but they are able to live and to graze in areas that can be unsuitable for growing crops. So if you have a field with a suitable soil profile and soil nutrients and a large enough area, you can grow all the crops that you want. However, sometimes you can have a very rocky hill or an area that has a really poor uh, soil profile that you would not be able to grow these crops on. So although livestock produce less food per unit area, at least you can have them there. So they can live there, they can grow and develop there, and you can have, have, you can have your livestock being produced in habitats that are unsuitable for growing crops. And finally, just a, a round up here, just a couple of pictures for you, is this idea between sustainable and unsustainable? Because we're going to come back to this at a different point. Just have a think of what is more sustainable. If you have the small amount of chickens all being cared for in a particular way, all having uh, appropriate life systems, nutri the nutrients they require, or the sort of mass factories that you can see sometimes on TV, where you have uh, animals being pumped full of nutrients. This is to feed a growing population but this is in every way unsustainable. We can't keep doing that for as long as possible. At some point it's going to crumble, but this is all a response to the growing human population. So in terms of hire, this is what you have to remember. The idea between the growing human population needs to be fed, and to do so we're having to try and find new means to feed the growing population. But we also need to look at what's going to work long time in terms of sustainability, and what is only a short-term fix, which is would be totally unsustainable. Right, thank you very much for listening in, Hire, and uh, make sure you go on to the 1B video of this, because this is not the end of this key area. We're about to move on to plants and on to uh, photosynthesis, which is a little bit more complicated, but hopefully being split up will be a bit earlier, a bit easier uh, for you. So thank you very much for listening, and make sure to tune in to the next video. Speak to you soon.